Welcome back to Mentor Nation, the podcast for entrepreneurs looking for real mentorship, real strategies, and real stories so that you can go out and build your dreams. I'm your host, John Abbas, and it's time for another episode, so buckle your seatbelt and let's go. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Mentor Nation podcast. It is your host, John Abbas, still at home still quarantining myself, but I am really excited to share the interview that I have for you today. So just a little bit of backstory. My fiance has been a successful realtor for over three years now. And one of the things that we have recently started doing with our extra money is invest in real estate. And so, you know, my background is not real estate and knowing nothing about that business A little while back, several months ago, I started listening to a lot of podcasts about real estate, also just reaching out to people that I know that own a lot of real estate just to ask some questions, and honestly, just doing everything that I can to try and learn as much as possible so that I can make smart decisions before putting our money into a deal. And so one day, I was listening to a podcast episode, and the title was really catchy. It was... This lady made $3,500 per month in cash flow from one deal. And the young woman by the name of Pollock Shaw was the one who achieved this, and she was on the Bigger Pockets real estate podcast. And it was one of the most incredible podcast episodes I've ever listened to. And come to find out after hearing her story, I was even more blown away. She was just a regular person. She had no experience in real estate whatsoever. She was a mechanical engineer by trade. She started a family, had kids. And one day, you know, trying to balance it all, she asked her boss for a more flexible schedule so she could spend more time at home. And her boss said no. And so that made her extremely frustrated. She started thinking of like, all the different ways that she could get out of her job so that she could spend more time at home with her family. And after some thought, she decided that her best bet was real estate, to become a real estate investor. Fast forward three years, and she has built a real estate portfolio worth more than $4 million, and she is absolutely crushing it. I was so inspired by that episode. I reached out to her right away on Instagram and believe it or not, she responded. And so if you're wondering like, how did she do it? How did she go from no experience from scratch, working a full-time job with a new family to building a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio in three years? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this interview. Pollock shares her story, her strategy, and all the awesome details in this interview, and I'm telling you, it is going to blow you away. Now, really quick, before I bring Pollock on, if you have ever wondered how I book these incredibly successful guests on the show, how I go about finding ultra-successful people and get them to mentor me and, and network with them then you need to grab the free blueprint that I just created for you. Just head on over to mentornationpodcast.com and click free blueprint. You can't miss it. There's literally two flashing arrows that are, (laughs) I had the designer do that on purpose. So there's no way that you can go to the website and not catch it. In it, I share everything I know and everything I do from a strategy standpoint, and I just know it will help you. Again, just go to mentornationpodcast.com, click free blueprint, put in your email, and it will be right in your inbox. Now, without further ado, please help me welcome Pollock Shaw. Pollock, thank you so, so much for being on the podcast. It is an honor to have you on Mentor Nation. And uh, yeah, just thank you for being on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So before we get into the episode, I just have to explain kind of how this all came to be so the audience knows because it's, it's, I think it's a funny story. So I, uh, we're building a tech startup right now. One of our co-founders is our developer. He develops mobile apps, but he's also a very avid real estate investor. So he owns probably 30 or so doors and 
he's the one that just kind of got me on the real estate, just got me interested in it. And so he's like, you got to listen to the Bigger Pockets podcast. It's a great podcast about investing. And so I, I listened to an episode and you were the first episode I listened to. And I'm listening oh, to really? it. Yes. And like immediately when it was over, I, I texted Kat. I'm like, you've got to listen to this episode. She has the greatest story ever. She was unhappy with this and she made a decision and then now she's absolutely crushing it. And so I just, I reached out I, as soon as it was over, I followed you on Instagram. I reached out and I was just so excited because you responded and here we are on the podcast and you are going to share some amazing wisdom with the audience. But, you know, I just, I want you to know before we get into it, you know, you really are a perfect example of the story that we all love to hear, right? Like something isn't working in your life, so you made a decision to do something different. And then it wasn't comfortable, you didn't have any experience, but you took action, you made mistakes, you figured it out, and then you had amazing success. And it's just like, it's what makes movies great, it's what makes success stories of entrepreneurs great. And honestly, I just feel that what you're going to talk about today is more relevant now than ever, as you probably know, because the coronavirus has shaken up a lot of people. It stopped many people's primary incomes and millions of people right now, especially, are just probably rethinking their whole strategy when it comes to making money. They're looking for other ways to add income. And so before we get into your story, I wanted to ask, could you just share a little bit like a snapshot of your life today? how long you've been real investing in real estate, what you've built over the last few years, and just what you're currently working on. Yeah. So right now, I've been full-time, a full-time real estate investor for three years. Wow. I have about 30, 30 some properties right now. And after doing this for three years, I realized that there is a way out of the corporate life and especially for parents. Mm -hmm. So our big thing right now is I really want to teach other people to get out of the grind and build their own real estate portfolios. I'm really working on helping more and more people get there through our coaching program. That's awesome. So you've only been investing for three years. Yeah. Full time for three years. Yep. And you didn't have experience beforehand. No. <laughs> and you have 30 properties. So this is, this is what I can't wait to talk about today. So take us back a little bit. So now, now we know where you're at today. What I'm really interested in is just what, can you tell us a little bit about your story? So like what, you know, what was your background? What happened that led you to make the decision to be an entrepreneur? Um, yeah. So I'm a mechanical engineer and I was in corporate for 17 years. I was climbing the corporate ladder and I thought I had a really good life. Like I had, my job was to travel to different countries and help CEOs improve the, their bottom line with this framework that we had developed. Mm -hmm. And it was really nice. I was around smart people. I was traveling, you know, to different interesting places and it's all great if you don't have kids. So my husband and I... <laughs> When we were just a couple, we didn't have kids. It was great. I loved the lifestyle. Right. And then um, when I had kids, so I had two kids back to back in a span of less than two years. And we waited till the late 30s because that's what I thought was the right thing to do is become right. financially stable, get your career up to the point where you know you have imagined it to be and then decide to have kids. But the issue is that the higher up you go, the less time you have for your family. So to sustain right. that lifestyle, that stressful lifestyle, which is, involves a lot of traveling, long hours, meeting the expectations you've set for yourself and you know other people have set for you, it's really hard to then give time to a baby that, right. <laughs> that you just brought That's into right. this world. So, so I went to my boss and because I had two very small children, I said, you know, I need some flexibility. I never get to see my kids. I leave the house when they're still sleeping and I come home just in time to put them to bed. And I said, can I work from home a couple of days a week or something? And he was very sure that I wasn't going to work. So, wow. so I, I spent months in turmoil because it was a huge change. I had worked there for 17 years. I had worked you know, to get a master's degree, to build up a reputation. And then my husband and I decided after months of debating this, that 
you know, we have to take the risk and become a single income family. And, mm-hmm. and I had to figure out a way to make an impact while still being able to spend time with my kids. So what we had done was after my daughter was born, we had bought a couple of rentals that were just rent ready properties. We bought them and rented them out. And it was a good experiment to figure out whether this strategy was good for us. So I decided to just focus on growing the portfolio. That's awesome. So that was going to bring me to my next question, which was why did you choose real estate versus something like consulting in the industry that you'd spent so many years or owning a traditional business like a mom and pop. So would you say it was because you already had a couple of rental properties or more because you felt like you could make a better impact? Yeah. So the big thing was I was looking for something that would give me flexibility. So real estate investing, especially passive rentals, the way I do it, Mm long-term passive rentals, that is more of a, a flexible side of real estate where, where you can, you know, work and grow as much as you want on right. your own time. So, and having tried that with a few properties before jumping in full time, it seemed like the best option. Gotcha. Okay. I love that. So I can't wait to get into your first deal because I mean, that's the hard part, right? Like at some point people have to go from listening to podcasts all day and reading real estate books to actually doing it. And so I just, I, I want to talk about that, taking that leap and getting into your first deal and actually applying the knowledge. So how much time did you spend learning about real estate before you really just jumped into it? So when I became full-time, mm-hmm. a full-time real estate investor, we just did a deep dive. Like I would stay up late at night after kids go to bed. My husband and I would listen to podcasts. We read every book we could get a hand, our hands on, <laughs> approached it like a student. And after, after doing that for a while, I realized that at some point I'm going to have to take a chance and, right. and try, try it out. We found a strategy that we liked. We narrowed it down and I was like, you know what? I'm going to find a property to apply this on. And at some point you just have to pull the trigger and take a, right. take the risk. Absolutely. Now, where did you find your, your first deal? The first property that you bought, like, where did you go to find that? So the first property I bought, I bought it from a wholesaler. So wholesalers are people who help homeowners sell properties that are too distressed to, you know, put it on the, multi- the, the, the MLS, the multiple listing service. Yep. And so they, so I found it through a wholesaler and um, it was in the Germantown section of Philadelphia, which is an up and coming area. To be honest with you, I was, I would say about 80, 85% sure it was going to work. <laughs> all of the theory, you, you know, you can do as many calculations as you want, but That's there's right. nothing like actually trying it out. Gotcha. That's awesome. So can you tell us, can we do a little bit more of a deep dive into that deal? So was it a, a yeah. single family home? Was it a duplex? What was yeah. that? Part? So it was a single family home. It, we bought it for 55000 The The day we went to see the property, I had no idea how any of that worked. I had just bought a property, put 25% down, buy a property that was rent ready and rented it out. That's all I had done before. <laughs> so we went in there and <laughs> apparently, you know, the way this works is to make to make things seem very competitive. What they, what they were doing was they were showing it only for two hours that day. And there were tons of people there. And they were like, okay, if you want it, you have to give us a check for $5,000 right now, a cashier's check. And I'm like, I didn't bring a cashier's check. <laughs> so we had taken a contractor with us. This contractor was somebody who had done a little bit of work for us before. Yep. And we had taken him with us and he kind of gave us a rough estimate. And he said, you guys have been, you know, learning about this and you've been wanting to do this for a while. I don't want you to lose this deal. So he lived around the corner from the property. So like he drove home and his wife (laughs) wrote a check and we were (sighs) able to get it under contract like right then. So needless to say, you know, that my loyalty is (laughs) with the contractor and we still work with him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is that's a great story. I'm just thinking I'm like, wow, I wonder if my my contractor would do that for me. I'm, I'm going to ask him. I'm going to call him but like, hey man, if we were in a deal, 
<laughs> and I didn't have, I, I'm kidding. That's, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. And so, so how did that deal ended up work? Like, how did it end up going? So you, you bought the property, obviously it was distressed, which is why you couldn't just list the property. It needed too much work. And so I'm, I'm assuming that contractor came in and made it rent ready. So how much did you end up putting into it to get it to that point? So we put in about another $50,000 into the property and got it rent ready. It was my first property. So I, I feel like I over improved it just a little bit. We were like, let's open up the kitchen. Let's do all of this stuff that we don't actually need to do. So we improved it by, I would say about 5,000 more than I should have spent. Okay. But overall it was still the, bu- it was still within the budget. And when we were done, I was able to rent it out for thirteen ninety five, I think. Hmm. And it appraised for one fifty five. So that's to, awesome. Yeah. To, so till you know, until the appraiser came, and you know, right when I saw the appraisal amount, that's when I was like, okay, this worked. Like this, I was actually able to do this right. <laughs> until then, I was like, okay, there is a fifty fifty chance whether you know, yeah, this go down. that's awesome. So now. Obviously, on future deals, I'm I'm so curious to this because you know I'm a, just for fun. We're we're very busy with our businesses, but for fun, we're doing some real estate investing as well. And so I'm very curious. You know, do you do you really negotiate on every sale price? Like whenever something is listed, or whether it's a wholesaler, like do you always try to negotiate and see what? You, or do you run your numbers first and see what it's worth, and then have you know? a foundation for negotiating and trying to get a better price? That's such a great question. That's a really good question. So yes, so I have my own deal calculator that I have built. You have to start, so let me go back to the strategy we use so that what I'm going to say makes sense, right? So we use the value add investing strategy. It's also known as the Burr strategy. So the concept is you purchase a property and renovate it. So as I was telling you, we purchased a property for 55,000, put another 50, 55,000 into it. So all in, we were about 100 to 110,000 mm-hmm. into the property. And then you wanted to appraise for more than what you put into it. So you wanted to appraise for 150 some thousand so that you can take it to a bank and ask them to refinance it. So they will, when they refinance it, you will get a mortgage on it they would want a certain percent of equity in the property. Yep. So say they say, uh, we want you to have at least 20, 25% equity in the property. You can pull all of your original cash out and move it over to the next deal while still owning the, the original property, which is cash flowing. Meaning after you pay all of your expenses, you still make a margin per month from the rent. So that's, that's the concept of the strategy. So I was just wondering if you negotiate like every single right. deal, like if you're always just seeing what's the lowest you can get it for, uh, or do you just, yes. do you look at a deal and you're more concerned with how much more value? Cause you know, like I come from a middle Eastern family, right? So like my dad, I mean, he'll negotiate anything. He'll go to the grocery store <laughs> and be like, can I get this orange for a dollar, not a dollar. Like I mean, things yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. even negotiate for. So I'm just interested in your mindset with deals like, you obviously a lot of money in real estate is made on the buy. So yes. are you focused more on the negotiation side in the beginning or more on what you can do to the property after? Yes. Thank you. Great, great question. And I'm South Asian, so I completely get it. <laughs> so, so, so yes. Yeah, so what in this strategy, the reason I went, you know, deep into the strategy is because in this strategy, you don't start with how much you buy the property for you start with what is the property going to be worth when I'm done with it. So you start with that $150,000, $160,000 that the property is going to be worth. You start putting in how much money is it going to take to renovate it. You start analyzing it based on how the bank is going to refinance it for you. And then come up with a price that you can afford to pay for the property. So it could be the list price. It could be a much lower price. And if the numbers work, then great. 
Uh, that makes, okay, that makes perfect sense. And <clears throat> this actually leads me into what you had already hinted on a little bit that I really want to share. Because obviously, there's a strategy that I want to talk about that you follow to a T. And since this isn't a real estate podcast specifically, a lot of the people listening might not know what that is, but it's a very powerful strategy especially like to go from buying your first property to owning several. And it's how you've built your portfolio to 30 properties in three years. And it's called Burr. And for those listening, when you said Burr earlier, I'm sure some of the audience is like, was she cold? Like, what is she saying? But Burr is actually an acronym that stands for, well, I'll, I'll let you explain it. Do you mind explaining what Burr stands for? Okay. So I wanted to uh, talk about, and you'd hinted on it a little earlier, but it was a strategy that, that you use that you've mastered. And it's, it's really what took you from a single to 30 properties in three years, because that's what people want is like, what's the best strategy for speed, from knowing nothing? I mean, obviously patience is key, but if somebody can have a way to do in five years what takes most people 20 to 30 that's powerful. And, and you've done that. And so you mentioned it earlier and I, because the audience doesn't know much about real estate, I'm assuming when you said Burr, they probably thought you were cold. And so, <laughs> <laughs> but Burr is actually an acronym. And I just, can you explain that acronym and what it means? And then we're going to talk about how that relates to what you've built. Sure. Great question. So the Burr strategy is basically the letter B and then four R's. The B stands for buy. Mm -hmm. And then the four R's stand for rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. So the strategy relies on the fact that when you purchase a distressed property and renovate it, and then once you rent it out, also known as stabilizing this property, when you take it to a bank to get it refinanced, you will be able to have generated more equity in the property than what you originally put into it. And that allows you to pull all of your original cash back out and still have and own a cash flowing property. And by cash flowing, I mean, as I was saying before, is when you pay all your expenses from the rent, you still have a difference than you can, that you can make every month. And the reason I love this strategy is there are multiple ways of making money in real estate, right? There right. is, you can become a service provider, like an agent, a wholesaler, go into construction, you can start flipping, you know, and, and generate income. This strategy is great because not only does it allow you to build an income per month, it also allows you to build wealth because you're owning these properties. That's so powerful. So let's apply that to your deal. So you buy a property for 55000 you put another 50000 into it. So you're all in for about 100 to 110000 so after you make it look beautiful, you rent it out and you're making $1,300 a month and then you get an appraisal. And so the appraisal is like, hey, okay, I've got this property. I put 110000 into it. It's cash flowing every single month. It's now worth 150. dollars So you can take that to a bank and say, okay, I want to refinance this property. And how much like of a loan will they give you? Is it 60, 70%? Like what do you look for? Like, so you take this go to a bank and you want to refinance this property that is worth 150000 How much do you think you can get as a, like, for refinancing from that? How much will the bank lend you? The refinancing piece, it depends on a lot of factors. It okay. depends on the market. And so when I was doing it a few years ago, the interest rates were a little bit higher than what they are right now, but mm -hmm. the banks were willing to lend you with a little less equity in the property. So right. they, they would allow you to, you know, have only 20% equity in the property and lend you the 80%. Now they might want, you know, you to leave more equity in the property, but then you get better interest rate. So it all depends on the market cycle we're in. It also depends on, so for properties under five units, you back up most of these refinance loans with your credit. Okay. So it also depends on the borrower's credit, your debt to income ratio, meaning how much debt you have that you need to you know, pay monthly versus how much income you have. Mm -hmm. 
And so it, it depends on the variety on a variety of factors. It depends on the deal. They want to know that it's a nice cash flowing property to be able to lend you enough money. But around, I would say around uh, 70 to 80 percent is what I have seen being lent. Awesome. So let's just say 70 percent. So they'll loan you 70 percent of the value of that hundred and fifty thousand dollar property. So let's just say that's I don't know, maybe a hundred thousand or something. Right. Yeah, exactly. whatever it is. So you can take that 100000 and then you do it again. It's, that's mm-hmm. the repeat, right? Like you go right. and you find another property. And this is what you've done to just – now, I do have a couple of questions. So when you rent the property out after you've rehabbed it, how long before you can go to the bank and refinance? Do you have to hold on to it for a while or can you just go like the next day and do yeah, it? Yeah, great question. Uh, this is – what you're referring to is known as seasoning. So some banks require, you know, a property to be seasoned, meaning they want you to own it for three months, six months, a year, depending on the bank. And some banks don't. So some banks have zero seasoning, meaning you can buy it today and take it to them the next day and they will refinance refinance it as long as their conditions are met. That's that's awesome. So have you stayed with single family homes or duplexes or are you starting like is your strategy to get into like bigger and bigger multifamily like fiveplexes and apartment buildings or like kind of what's your strategy been over the last three years so we have been doing under five unit deals so i will find sometimes i will find a portfolio of properties and acquire them but the properties that are within the portfolio are usually under five units. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm excited now to talk about some of the mistakes that you made. Your story has sounded unbelievably perfect so far, but I'm sure there's been some like, oh my gods, on just on your journey. And you know, that's what people relate to because we're all going to make them. So can you talk about like maybe just some of the big mistakes that you've made or just a few of the things that you wish you had known earlier on as a brand new investor? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is I didn't hire a coach right away. I waited a couple months before I did a deep dive into all the information that I could get my hands on online. And I could have started like two months earlier if I had, you know, invested in my education right away. I did invest in coaches um, eventually and, you know, acquired different skill sets from different people, learn different things. One of the big mistakes that comes to mind is we were not changing locks on our properties like the very next day, which is what everybody should be doing. (laughs) I found out (laughs) my contractor called me, you know, we we closed, say we closed today, tomorrow he calls me very next day. He, he, he goes out, start the work and he calls me and he's like, you know, the boiler is missing in this property. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, I was like, okay, I, I get it. So now we have a locksmith on standby. As soon as we close, I, I call him and I'm like, go. If, if the, we own the property. You can go for it. Go and change the locks, please. But yeah, we, so, so that was one of the things that I wasn't doing. But one thing I will say is no matter how much you learn, you always make mistakes in, in real estate investing or in entrepreneurship as you have probably experienced there are yep. always mistakes to be made and it's a part of the process. So just being comfortable with the fact that this is going to happen, it really helps. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now I read that you have one deal that you did that cash flows you $3,500 per month on a single deal. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> so I'm interested in that deal just because that's more obviously than the average American makes in the United States working 40 hours a week. And so that's very powerful on one single deal that you were able to exceed an average American salary. Can you just talk a little bit about that deal and and what happened and how you were able to capitalize so much on that one property? Yeah. So we were, I was looking for uh, multifamilies under five units and my favorite app is Redfin. So I use Redfin you can use any app like Zillow. So I used Redfin and I was looking in the neighborhood that I really like. And I saw that there were three properties right next to each other listed for the exact same price. Mm. And that was a good indicator that 
they may belong to the same seller. So I went in, t- took a look. It was the same description, very similar photos, and the same agent. So I called, called that agent. Turns out it was three triplexes side by side. And one mm-hmm. of them actually had a basement apartment too. So it was like a 10 unit deal. Each of them was listed for 207. Mm-hmm. So 207 per property. So we, there are multiple ways in which we negotiated this. So one of the things that I was telling her was the, the agent that I can make this easy for the seller. We can purchase all three properties, but the numbers have to work. So once right. I took my contractor in, the, the only way I could make the numbers work was if I purchased each for 125. Mm-hmm. So we purchased all three, three of them for 125 each. We put in about seventy, eighty thousand dollars per property to renovate it. And when we were done, they appraised all three of them together for almost a million dollars. And <laughs> yeah, the rent is around I think eleven or twelve thousand dollars for for the entire I, I just call it like one building, even though it's not. Yep. And after all the expenses. My cash flow is around thirty five hundred a month, and real estate cash flow is different than other incomes, right? So when you deduct depreciation, you actually don't end up paying taxes on this. So think of you know the a number like thirty five hundred a month, and think of not paying taxes on it. Absolutely. You're you would have to make a much higher salary to make that much take home income. Absolutely, man, that is. That is incredible. Now, do you do your own property managing or do you have somebody? I do my own property managing. Oh, okay. Perfect. Now, that brings me obviously to an important question is, is there a risk tolerance that you have in like the, I mean, obviously I know the goal is up and coming neighborhoods, right? But a lot of them are neighborhoods that are going through like some sort of gentrification. Like they're terrible now, but they're, you know, people are investing. Like, do you focus on a certain quality of neighborhood like i think they i'm not sure is it like a b c is that how they grade neighborhoods these days like b plus b minus so yeah we really like to be in b to c neighborhoods that's like where i like to invest i really think though that you know if somebody's just getting started if you're listening to this it's all about your comfort level and i really think that just because everybody else is investing in war zones because they're more profitable and they are because you know the, the rent may not be that much lower than B or C neighborhoods, but the properties are much cheaper in right. D neighborhoods doesn't mean that that's right for you, right? So everybody has to figure out what their comfort level is and what their strategy is and go with that knowing that financially it may not, it's not just about numbers, right? It's not, it's all about your comfort level and Especially if you keep property management in house, you have to be comfortable going there and dealing with the tenants. And so B two C neighborhoods are my favorite. These are hardworking people. They need a good place to live, and we provide higher quality rentals than anything around where they live. And I like doing that. You're providing housing to someone, so it also gives some fulfillment. And you know, you're you're that's all. (laughs) And I, I asked that because last night, me and Kat, we were on LoopNet. <laughs> we were looking at Memphis, Tennessee, and we were like, oh my God, there's this 24-unit apartment complex for sale for $300,000. And, <laughs> and we're like, that's such a good deal. And then we look at the pictures and we're like, oh, oh dear, we were probably good. we would probably die <laughs> if we bought that. It was like, we were looking at the area, we were Googling like crime mapping and it was like F, 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 we're like, oh, okay, never mind, never mind. So I was just curious as to kind of how that strategy. So now as of today, like how are you finding most of your deals now? Because, and, and the reason I ask that is, especially the young people that are listening to this, you know, I've always taught anybody that I've ever mentored is until you have the money use your time, you know, be valuable, find mentors, but do the things that they can't do, which is, you know, the things that they don't have the time to do. So you may not have money, but you have time and, you know, wealthy mentors have money, but they don't have the time. And so one of the first things I'm assuming that people could do if they don't have any money to invest whatsoever is start learning 
but finding deals. Because if you find a really good deal, there's always going to be money that follows the deal. Like where do you find your deals or where would you, like how would you, what advice would you give an audience that they're listening to this and they have no money, but they would love to learn like how to find deals and maybe partner with investors? Yeah, finding deals for me, I mean, I still find deals on the MLS, Mm -hmm. but we found deals through wholesalers. Sometimes when neighbors see that we clean up the streets, we clean up the back alleys, we care about the community, people bring deals to us. When, when they see that, you know, we, we do a good job renovating it, we're not just about the money, uh, neighbors will come up to us and be like, you know, such and such person down the street wants to sell their house, you should talk to them. So there are multiple ways that once you get building in that deal pipeline, they start flowing. One thing I would say is defining your strategy is key. Right. And really figuring out what type of deal you're looking for before trying to find those deals is super important. So I always say like, you know, remember if you're just starting out, remember three S's, three S's, small, simple, and scalable. Mm. Look for something small. Like if you're just starting out, don't go out and try to, without owning any real estate, go, don't go out and try to buy like a hundred unit apartment building. Look for something simple. If you have zero construction experience, don't go out and buy a fire damaged property. <laughs> That's a good way to <laughs> get into a project that, that you could grossly un, you know, underestimate how much it's going to cost to renovate and scalable, meaning you know, pick something that you can do again and again. If you go in a neighborhood and there is a single distressed property and everything else has been renovated, then you you know, understanding that neighborhood really well and all the time it's going to take to, you know, figure out all of the numbers. It's not worth it for just one project. Pick something that's scalable. Go into a neighborhood where you can do deals again and again. Awesome. I love that. So to finish up here, I want to gear the rest of this, the last couple of minutes just toward the audience. You know, what advice would you give the audience that's listening to this? And they would like to start investing in real estate to create another source of income. Like what, like, you took a deep dive, right? You bought every book that you could. Is there two, three books that you recommend? Is there one or two podcasts that you really recommend? Like if you were starting all over, you don't have any of the knowledge, you just know where to find it. You don't have it yet, but you know where to find it. Like what resources would you dive into right now to try and learn all that you can in the next 90 days? I would highly recommend the Bigger Pockets podcast mm-hmm. where you found me. <laughs> that's, a, that's, right. that's a really great podcast. Great podcast. <laughs> um, they also have really good blogs and a couple of books that I like are, I like the, the one book that I really not like is um, The One Thing by Gary Keller. That's a really good book. I also have a free ebook on my website. So it's open space spaceswomen.com forward slash ebook. It's mm. all about getting started and taking the leap of faith. It's very short, but it, it kind of helps narrow down the perspective from, oh my God, there's all of this information out there. How do I narrow this down? How do I, you know, take the next step? So that's a, that's an option. It's free. And I like the, the book by Napoleon Hill. Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich. Thank you. Yes. That's <laughs> a great book. Fantastic book. Now, speaking of the one thing, we were actually supposed to have done this interview a month ago, but because of the virus, he had to reschedule Jay Papazon, who co-authored The One Thing with Gary Keller. So we're probably going to do it here in about a month once everything calms down. So I'm excited to have him on the podcast. Also, and I want to stress this, it's really important because I think a lot of people, they they want to just learn all that they can. And there's like a million ways to make money in real estate. And so you said something that was very powerful. It's just make sure you, you pick your strategy. You know, if it's going to be single family, single family, if it's going to be multifamily or commercial, it's like, don't try to do everything, but do one thing. And we've talked a lot today about the Burr method. And that's what I'm focused on now, just on the side is because it's the, it's the best thing I've ever seen. Like out of everything I've learned, Burr makes the most sense. You just, it's the greatest way to create cash flow and wealth using leverage at like all at the same time. I just, I really, really love that. So as we wrap up, if you had to leave the audience with one big takeaway, whether it's a strategy or just a mindset, what would you tell them? Um, I would say if you're just getting started, it's 
you have to have a strategy in place. So pick a strategy. It's better than having no strategy at all, even if you change it in future. But pick a strategy, do a deep dive into it, and then move on to the next thing. It's so important to narrow things down from the beginning, even if you plan to change them in future. Awesome. I love that. Now, to finish this out, I really want to give you a shout out because you're doing a lot of coaching now. And I mean, I just, who wouldn't want a coach, right? That has done walk the walk and has done exactly what they're teaching, right? Like, so I, I don't know, like, cause I know when I listened to you on bigger pockets, your portfolio was like, it was almost 4 million. I think, is that still the case? Like it's yeah, 4 million. Yep. That's in three years. I mean, that's so incredible. And so you do a lot of coaching now. Can you please share with the audience? Cause I know a lot of them are going to want to know how can I have Pollock coach me or where can I find her content and resources? And I want to direct them straight to you because you're just, you're great at what you do. And I can vouch for that. Um, where can people find you, follow you? What type of coaching do you offer and how can people take advantage of that? Oh, thank you. Gr- great question. So you can find me on Instagram at open spaces women. I started coaching with women in mind because for me, motherhood changed everything. So my Instagram account is open spaces women, but I don't coach just women. You know, it's about not just about motherhood. It's about parenthood. Parents need right. To find a way so yeah we so open spaces women on instagram you can follow me there and what we do is i have a, a a three month coaching program that is interactive so it's a small group coaching program and i take you from start to finish in this the strategy that i use the birth strategy that we just talked about and we supercharged it to be able to you know grow so quickly and I have a lot of systems and processes that I acquired from my corporate days that I have used in this industry to be able to grow fast. So we teach all of that from start to finish, three months. It's all virtual, but interactive. So you work with me directly. That's awesome. So and I know for me personally, because we're venturing into real estate investing, and one thing's, you know, I love bigger pockets, but one of the things I haven't seen is for us, it's just a deep dive on running the numbers is one of those things that's really important for us, right? Like, do you do that as well? Like run it? How do you really? So, cause that's like, I mean, finding deals. I mean, especially who knows, right. In the next several months, I'm assuming that real estate, there's going to be a lot more deals available if things go how it's looking. But you know, for me, the thing has always been like, okay, I see the property. How do I run the numbers exactly? Because if, even if I'm like, two numbers off, it could like literally kill profit. So I think that's so powerful. So guys, if you're listening to this and you're in a position where you'd love to diversify or have another stream of income or just real estate investing in general is something that's important, guys, make sure you follow Pollock, take advantage of what she is doing and offering. You know, and I always say this, you know, it's, it's very rare to find someone that's extremely successful in their early days of coaching, right? Like a lot of times you get coaching from someone that coaches 50,000 people. And so it's so diluted, but like, you're just in that perfect, well, maybe after this podcast, you, you'll have to do the same thing. <laughs> but it's, no, I, I think the small group programs are really important for real estate investing because then you can analyze the live deals and, and really do a deep dive into numbers, which is the fun part. So I, I love it. that. I love that. So make sure you follow her. I'm going to put all of your links and everything in the show notes. Pollock, it is so, 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 it was so nice to have you on this podcast. I can't thank you enough for your time. And it's an absolute pleasure. And hopefully we'll get to have you on here again soon. Yes, yeah, sounds good. It was really great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right, guys. I really, really hope you enjoyed that interview with Pollock Shaw. I highly encourage you to follow her, connect with her. I will put all of the details in the show notes, her links and how you can follow her content. She just absolutely crushed that interview and she was so fun to talk to. Just a regular person trying to make it happen that with a little bit of focus and some work ethic and some organization went on to build a hugely successful business in a very short period of time. And to me, honestly, that's what it's all about. And I just want to thank you guys for listening so much to this episode, guys. Look, if you enjoy this episode, if you enjoy this podcast, or if you hate this podcast, but you're just willing to do me a favor, guys, just leave us a five-star review. Say some kind words about us. The way algorithms work is 
your ba- like the popularity is based on reviews and number of listens. So listen, share this podcast with a friend. If you know someone that's trying to make it happen, wants to be an investor, maybe real estate investing is something they thought about doing. You know, just copy the link, send it over. I would greatly appreciate it. I hope all of you guys are staying safe. I hope you all are thriving and doing well, taking this time to learn new skills and just to better yourself. And you already know that I will be back next week with another really, really incredible episode. So buckle down, have a wonderful week, and I'll see you next time.